Immediately after the NFL Combine, we did a full mock offseason here on Locked on Dolphins with the offseason blueprint. With the actual offseason having largely come and gone, it's time to compare our notes and see what we said in March versus what we've actually got. You are Locked on Dolphins, your daily Miami Dolphins podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, Miami, welcome to another episode of Locked on Dolphins. It is your team every day here on the Locked on Network. I'm your host, Kyle Krabs, a lifelong Miami Dolphins fan, host of Locked on Dolphins, co-host of Locked on NFL Scouting. You can find our shows on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Tip of the cap to our everydayers because it is your team every day. We don't just say it. We live it here on the Locked On Network. Today's episode of Locked On Dolphins is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for $20 off your first purchase or last minute tickets with the lowest prices. Guaranteed. Defensive side of the ball today. We did the offensive side of the ball yesterday. There's also some big picture uh, discussion points that I think are, are worth highlighting as it pertains to. Uh, the mock draft that we had, kind of the ideology applying uh, into the mock draft versus what the Dolphins actually did in the draft. But just to set the table kind of the same way we did yesterday, the offseason blueprint is one of my favorite projects every year. It's my chance to kind of assess where the team is at, assess the team's options, and say, look, this is based off of the tone and messaging and and where the, the team is at, what direction we think they will go or should go, and what they can realistically get done in an offseason to put together a, a, a 53 man for next year. And we do uh, cap management, we do roster cuts, we do free agency, we do a mock draft, uh, we do post June 1st. You get a 53 man forecast at the end of it. And then you also get like a three year snapshot of like, this is what the next three years of salary cap situation would look like based off of this 53 man roster to start the season. And a couple of things I want to highlight. I teased it at the end of yesterday's show. But I really want to highlight the blueprint from a salary cap perspective before we get into the personnel because I don't want this point to get lost in everything. Uh, the blueprint had a projected salary cap space for the Dolphins of $16.35 million in cap space for the 2024 season with a 53-man roster as of like September 1st. 16, almost 16 and a half million dollars. That included a Tyreek Hill contract restructure, which has not been done yet. Uh, that included the Tua Tongue Valoa contract extension that reduced his salary cap charge for this year. Neither of those two things have been done. The Dolphins, as things currently stand, are at about $16 million in cap space. And if you took where they stand right now and you take the guys that I have highlighted to do a 53 man roster cut, you're sitting at about 23 and a quarter million dollars in cap space. So like the actual off season is going to end up having about $7 million in cap space, give or take. Right. And we'll see, maybe that changes because Tyree kill gets an extension or gets an, either an extension or they move some running around on this contract. Maybe that changes because they do get the contract extension to a token. Well, they put the cash in the front of it, right? Like who knows what could still happen, but where we are at right now in time, say, the, the Dolphins get to the preseason, they go through the preseason, they cut the 53, and there's no other contractual traction. And if there is, you would be inclined to think if both of the things happen, there could be a give and take where it's still going to be put in that ballpark. $7 million more in cap space and less levers have been pulled at this point in time. That's pretty good when we get into the personnel that we're going to be exploring. And... We did the offensive side yesterday. I, I think they're better at wide receiver, running back, tight end than what I had forecasted. And just the budget didn't necessarily line up in reality versus what I had kind of budgeted for being competitive in the interior offensive line market. Uh, it, we did get Aaron Brewer right, though. Uh, defensively, it's a little bit more, feels like short term, uh, some short contracts. Now they did give out a couple of big contracts. We'll spot light all of that and kind of what I would have done at those positions versus what they've actually done. Uh, but the other part of this, this shoe that we're talking about at potentially about five to $7 million more in cap space than what the blueprint had as things currently stand, they got 
like forty million dollars more in twenty twenty five cap space as things currently stand. Some of that's because they didn't give out a bunch of long term contracts that I would have been interested in giving out. Uh, they did go more short term, so like you, you'll still have to find short term replacements or more long term players for those spots. But you, I mean, you're talking literally forty million dollar difference for projected cap. And take take the website projections for salary cap with a grain of salt because they aren't necessarily projecting the salary cap growth yet to be in the stratosphere of where you expect it's going to be. So you feel great. Uh, I, I look at the salary cap out like, like, man, we came out twice as good for this year and next year than what I had with the blueprint. And I felt pretty good about the long-term outlook with the blueprint back in March. And they generally got a better team, better, better team out, outlook than what we had when we assembled. If you're watching on YouTube, I'll put the depth chart up now the defensive side of the ball offseason blueprint. This one was fun uh, because I actually earmarked a number of guys that were just, hey, I don't know who it's going to be, but post-June 1st vet guys. We need guys in these spots. <laughs> and it was defensive tackle along with edge, along with safety. And I think you could sign Calais Campbell and mark him as, in reality, somebody capable of checking both of those boxes. And they signed Marcus May post June 1st. Those are those two post June 1st signings the Dolphins have right now. And they alleviate all three question marks for the 53. And they achieved it with two players as compared to three players. So I'm not a math guy, but if you open up an extra roster spot, especially with how competitive the rest of the Dolphins roster is, it's a nice win. And you got him for $2 million. It's pretty good. Um, the players in the actual offseason blueprint that I would have retained. The notable players, I should say, included, included Elijah Campbell on a one-year, $1.5 million contract. He got a one-year, $1.5 million contract. I was prepared to bring back Deshaun Elliott at safety. Again, this was post-combine, pre-free agency opening. Uh, it's important context because if you're watching on YouTube and you're not listening to what I'm saying and you're just reading the, the names on the, the screen, you're like, well, God, these guys left. Yeah, we know. Deshaun Elliott. I was budgeting about two and a half million per season for him. Uh, he actually signs a two year, $6 million contract at 3 million per season with Pittsburgh. So like the valuation was about right. Uh, they chose to go in a different direction for one reason or another. Andrew Van Ginkle was the big one as far as like the retained guys. Uh, and we perceived at the point in time of with the injuries to Phillips and Chubb having uh, a sturdy edge group, is important. Andrew Van Ginkle's kind of been that guy. I came up short, though. And, and I'll jump on the grenade with that one. Uh, my offer to Andrew Van Ginkle would have been an average of $8 million per season. So like two million, two years, $60 million contract. He, in reality, signs for two years, $20 million in Minnesota. So that's like Damian Lewis last year or last yesterday on the offensive side of the ball was a player who we got outbid for versus what I would have budgeted for in the blueprint to say, hey, I think this is a winning offer. I don't know what Miami really did offer Andrew Van Giggle. It sounded like they did offer him a contract, but um, the $8 million annual average that I had in place would not have beat Minnesota's offer. And in that case, you decide, do we continue to chase over, pursue and overpay, or do we go to the next guy in line and just go outside the source? And that's what the Dolphins did in reality with them signing Shaq Barrett. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, what they really did here in, in just a little bit. But I want to continue to work through some of the free agency class of guys that I had pegged, what the Dolphins actually have done in free agency. Uh, there was a Jerome Baker decision that I would have gone a different way with all of that. We'll get into all that next year on this episode of Locked on Dolphins, so make sure that you stick with us. Listen, football season is going to be here before and you know it. And if you are somebody who's a little bit more spontaneous, you love spur of the moment events. Make sure you get your tickets with Game Time. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace for Major League Baseball. They make getting tickets faster and easier. And prices on the Game Time app actually go down closer to first pitch with killer last minute deals, all in prices and views from your seat. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets for not just Major League Baseball, but all sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. You can save up to 60% off by buying last minute on Game Time. And with their all in pricing, there's no surprises when you put the tickets into your cart. You know exactly what you're signing up for, no surprise fees. And with their panoramic views, their sight lines from your seat, so you know where you're going to be sitting 
what your experience is going to be like before you commit to buying tickets. Guess, take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account. Use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off for your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, create an account. Redeem code Locked On NFL. L O C K E D O N NFL for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today for last minute tickets with the lowest prices guaranteed. So the rest of the uh, free agency crop that I had defensively back in March for the blueprint, I had Fali Fatukasi, who signed a healthy deal with Houston for one year's about $5 million. Um, that's about double what I expected that that budgeting was going to have to look like. Um, Rock Yassin, uh, one year's $3 million to be kind of a depth, the next depth corner. We anticipated that you were going to have to move on from Xavier Howard. That was kind of already reported when we did the blueprint. Or maybe that already happened. I think that already happened. Um, but it was like, hey, you know, Jalen Ramsey, Cam Smith, Cater Kohu, we will be prepared to put it all together. Well, spoiler, what the Dolphins actually did is a much more attractive option. Um, and it's kind of the latest reminder from an allocation of resources perspective where they're going to spend. They spent at corner. Big surprise. <laughs> they didn't even spend on the defensive line where uh, they they do get Calais Campbell, but they get Calais Campbell for an unbelievable value, and then they do a smorgasbord of interior defensive linemen to kind of be pulled in and let all this competition take place. And it's going to be really fascinating to see uh, who ultimately win ends up winning some of those spots. I would have kept Jerome Baker, um, or at least I would have in March. Uh, I would not have imagined that that Jordan Brooks, it would be a parallel move for the money, uh, but relative to the scheme, if their determination was needing to get a player who's better in coverage, you nod your head, you say, okay, um, that's if if that's the determination, then that's what we have to do, and it's a parallel move, then great, you, you make the move, and that's what they really did with Jerome. Uh, Baker versus Jordan Brooks, where they, they take a little bit of dead money this year. Brooke gets a deal that was about in the stratosphere of where I thought you probably could have extended Jerome Baker in the last year of his deal and knocked down a salary cap hit. Uh, they go in a different direction altogether. Um, Shaq Barrett, obviously not on the uh, on the radar with, with us in March talking about bringing back Andrew Van Ginkle, but I would also say Shaq Barrett on a one-year deal for the base value being cheaper than Andrew Van Giggle's budgeted blueprint dollars, right? That's another one of those margins things. You know, it's uh, winning in the margins when you're trying to compete at the highest of levels is really essential. And the ways in which Miami won in the margins includes signing guys like Calais Campbell post June 1st and getting him for an amazing contract value. Uh, they're not even really tapping into the June 1st money. Uh, winning in the margins includes some of these short-term contracts to improve your 2025 cap outlook so you have more flexibilities to get guys on the books, especially if you need to make a drastic decision to use the franchise tag next year. And there's going to be options, whether it's Javon Holland or it's Tua Tonga Below, if they don't get a contract extension done. Like, there's going to be guys that you'll be like, hey, franchise tag? Like, it could make sense. And I think Javon Holland um, would love to see a long-term contract to get done. But just from a predictive nature with the uh, Dolphins, I'm looking up what the franchise tag totals are. And I know this isn't the point of today's show, but we're going to go down the rabbit hole. Uh, 18. So it's a little higher than I thought, but it's also the fourth cheapest, I guess, technically third cheapest amongst like position players. One year total for that amount could be interesting. Um, obviously, I'd still like to see the long term contract get done first. Uh, the Rocky Sin to Kendall Fuller is the greatest discrepancy that we have. And like, shame on me for not thinking that the Dolphins weren't going to go out and get another corner, right? <laughs> like, I kind of assumed with the, the blueprint that you were going to have. Let me get the defense up. Let me get the defense up. Uh, Cam Smith just step into that role, and you're like, hey, Cam and Ramsey can. Can play inside. You have Cater who can play inside. Rocky Sin can play outside. Let's gives you some flexibility, but you're on a budget there. Well, their budget went towards linebacker between 
um, Jordan Brooks and corner again with what they got for, for Kendall Fuller in the two year, $15 million year contract. That's the biggest discrepancy. But if you take, Hey, we saved uh 33% of value by going Jordan Poyer over to Sean Elliott for his, their, his value versus Poyer's value for players that were in the same bucket as adequate level starters, both of them. Uh, we saved $2 million for Andrew Van Ginkle's competitive offer than what we were able to get from a base value for Shaq Barrett. And you put that together and you say, well, let, let, there's three and a half, four million dollars million if we can get Kendall Fuller for two years, 15, and put the void years on the back end of it, we can, it, it takes care of itself. Like, let's do that. And uh, that's that's where the margins can lead to an extra player who is a, spoiler alert, quality starter. And that's that's the big difference. Now, the forecast for the 53, at least on offense, it was like the numbers were relatively the same. We kept one less tight end than what we we had on the original blueprint from back in March. Defensively, the way that they've assembled it, it, it is a little enlightening to be like, okay, we were operating under the assumptions of roster numbers based off the Fangio scheme, but now we see like where they invested the, the the numbers that they brought in, and it does tell a little bit of a different story for what you should expect the numbers to look like defensively uh, for the Dolphins this year. And we're going to get into all of that next with the 53-man comparison for the defensive side of the ball here on Locked On Dolphins. So make sure that you stick with us. The 53 forecast right now um, is challenging because <laughs> there were a number of names I did not want to leave off. Uh, I think the most notable name from a salary cap perspective on the defensive side of the ball that did not make the cut was Duke Riley. Uh, you could save a few million dollars with that cut. And Duke is primarily a special teams type of player, right? That's where he's at his best. You bring in Cam Brown in free agency as kind of an under-the-radar signing. I think he's got a really good chance with the new kickoff rules to make the roster. Uh, Anthony Walker with starting experience, who can also play teams, uh, but I think has a higher ceiling than what Duke Riley does, despite being in the same bucket. Channing Tindall kind of on his last legs as far as the grace period that you're going to get, but I think him on a rookie contract versus Duke Riley and, and being the fifth linebacker, um, it was enough for me to say, Hey, you know, I, I think that's a hard cut and hard decision that I can choose to make. Uh, I really only have the dolphins starting the season with four edge guys. One of them is Phillips and there's two rookies on that list. It's Phillips Chubb, who I think will start on one of the, uh, inactive lists. So there's, there's one more name on here than there should be to get to 53. Um, but I think that's because Bradley Chubb would go on either IR or PUP and have a spot that's opened up. So it'd be Phillips, Barrett, Chop Robinson, Mohamed Kamara. That might feel a little lean, but remember Calais Campbell, who's on the interior defensive line group, can also play on the edge. So I think early in the season, you could see more of Campbell on the edge, and it's Phillips, Campbell, Barrett, Chop, Kamara. You can go to war with that group. You really can. And that's that's a couple of cornerstones. I graded Calais Campbell out for what we're presuming this defensive scheme looks like, and he grades as a quality starter, a, even at age 38 or whatever it is. Yeah, he is a dude, man. And that's really cool to put up on the team board and say, okay, this is where Christian Wilkins was last year. Is Calais Campbell a step down? Yeah. Is he not a long-term answer? Yeah. But he's $25 million less per season, and it's a marginal downgrade. That's, again... Winning in the margins. That's a huge boom for Miami. And the the blueprint on the interior defensive line, I only had four guys. It was Zach Sealer, post-June 1st vet would be Calais Campbell, Fali Fatukasi, who ends up getting twice in free agency, what I would have like been interested in spending for him as a player who got cut um, this past offseason. And then a rookie in McKinley Jackson, who we'll get into the mock draft in its entirety here. Uh, but McKinley Jackson was the player who I acquired with, 
I traded a 2025 three and a day three pick in the mock draft back in March to go up to 91 to get and, and manifest a new draft pick in this year's draft class. McKinley Jackson went 91 in the mock draft. His actual position, he went 97 uh, in the actual draft to, I believe, Cincinnati. So that's nice. You're, you're pretty close. We, the, the day the day one and day two, guys, we were pretty close on the value. Uh, day three, I guess through the fifth round, we felt pretty good. And then the, the sixth and seventh round guys that we targeted in the mock draft actually went pretty early. So it, predictably, it was the, these guys were hot commodities. So I guess that, that means we were targeting good players. Uh, but in reality, you weren't going to get them where they were in the mock draft. But more on that in just a minute. Um, the actual blueprint or the, the actual where things stand right now. A lot of bodies on the defensive line. Uh, I do question whether Tier Tart makes the roster. I think Harris and Jones for sure are going to be in a position to be in front of him. I wouldn't sleep on Neville Gallimore. Uh, but right now I have all six of those guys. I have Zach Sealer, Calais Campbell, Neville Gallimore, Jonathan Harris, Tier Tart, and Benito Jones. And the blueprint had Sealer, post-June 1st vet, which would be Campbell. Uh, rookie McKinley Jackson, and then Fali Fatukasi. Certainly a more variety, a wide variety group uh, in where we are at now projecting a 53. Uh, the blueprint on the edge, uh, we mentioned uh, Andrew Van Ginkle. Uh, we had a post June first player that, that it could theoretically be uh, Clays Campbell, but if we're going to count him in the interior defensive line, you would just cross that off and say, well, we won't carry that guy. Uh, Phillips Chubb, Van Ginkle, Darius Robinson, a first-round defensive lineman. The Dolphins, in reality, did pick a first-round defensive lineman. Uh, Marquise Haynes on the edge, who, if they were to go to the well, if they, if they in reality, were like, well, Chubb is going to start on a list, and we want Calais only inside, and we have Phillips Barrett and the two rookies, and we want a fifth guy. Um, I think Carl Lawson makes some sense. I believe they, they were in contract with him at some point this offseason, but like Marquise Haynes is still out there. And I think it would be a, a, probably at this point a minimum salary guy for you that as your fifth edge guy, I'd, I'd have some interest in. Uh, so he's still floating around out there, but I, I think they're pretty well positioned, especially with Campbell in the mix. Uh, linebackers, where things really start to get different with David Long, Jordan Brooks, Anthony Walker, Cam Brown, and Channing Tindall, the five linebackers that I have right now versus the blueprint had a status quo group from last year. David Long, Jerome Baker, Duke Riley, and Channing Tindall. I don't think there's any question the group that they have now has the potential to be better. With Walker and Brown, do you keep Tindall based on the upside, his individual player development? You would assume he's going to be better than he was last year, but you're not going to know for sure. Uh, Brooks grades as a same bucket as Jerome Baker type of player, but a very different skill set. So I think there's um, this is an improved room versus what we had with the, the blueprint. Um, I think you could probably say the interior defensive line is a better group too. Um, Phillips Chubb, Van Ginkle, Darius Robinson. And if you were to include like Calais Campbell as an edge guy for that group, maybe you could say the edge group was better. Uh, for the blueprint, but I would say definitely interior defensive line and linebacker. The reality of where we are at now and the players we're making decisions on is going to be a, a more robust group for you. And then the secondary is pretty self-explanatory. They, they got Kendall Fuller. Our answer to Xavier Howard leaving in the blueprint was a one-year contract for Rocky Sin versus a two-year $15 million contract for Kendall Fuller. He's a better player. Uh, also great as a quality starter like Xavier Howard did. So again, another same bucket type of player, a little bit more versatility. Uh, so that's a job well done by the Dolphins. And then safety, it it does get a little interesting. Uh, Marcus May being your third safety is a massive upgrade, I think, over Brandon Jones. Uh, Saran Neal as your special teams player and your fourth safety is a upgrade over Elijah Campbell, although I could see foresee Elijah Campbell like making the roster too. So it, for me, it was between Elijah Campbell and Ethan Bonner for kind of the last defensive back spot. I have 10 DBs on the roster, Ramsey, Cam Smith, Kendall Fuller, Cater Kohu, Nick Needham, Javon Holland, Jordan Poyer, Marcus May, Saran Neal, Elijah Campbell. There's a lot of experience in that group. And a couple of guys in Needham, Campbell and Neal that I think are primary special teams type guys. And that's 
our, our primary special teams type guys in, in the blueprint from back in March was Justin Bethel coming back, Jerry and Jones, a rookie, Elijah Campbell. It's a better group. They did laps around me. And, and again, that part of that is I don't want to be too overly ambitious when I do a project like that and put unfair expectations on all of you for what the season the season's gonna outlook or the, the season offseason outlook's gonna look like. But that like at least you could take that and say, like, hey, this is an objective look at what can get accomplished. And in reality, like you you can hope and aspire for it to be better than that. The final piece that we're going to go over is the mock draft in its totality. Um, some parallels. Uh, we had a defensive lineman going with their first round pick. We had an offensive lineman going with their second round pick. We had them trading a 2025 third round pick to get an extra mid round pick. We had them drafting a running back. Like all of those things actually happened. <laughs> it was just different answers. And again, that was kind of what I led with yesterday was this, the grading of the blueprint is not how many things did you get exactly right? It's like, what, what feel did you have with the broad brush for how they were going to go after things? That sort of feels good that like I traded down from 21 to 27 in a hypothetical trade because I was offered one in the mock draft simulation. Um, Miami's offer or potential offer. I don't know that they got a call from Detroit, but Detroit moved up from 29 from Terry and Arnold and they went up to 24 and gave up like 73. Would that have been too far for Miami? You're, you're, you're probably surrendering chop Robinson. It seemed like they really coveted him as a player. So if you stay put there. Okay. But that's what made the willingness to move to 2025 three, which we did in the mock draft and they did in reality, although to pick different players, um, that that helps you with this reset process that you're currently kind of in the works on and you you've seen them do it um in reality and in the blueprint you lose a little bit of top talent um or you you lose some significant top talent with Christian Wilkins and Robert Hunt leaving and Connor Williams leaving those hurt uh i think you have answers for two of the three though in reality and I didn't necessarily achieve that to the degree that the Dolphins did when I did the blueprint, in part because you're expecting some of those pathways to getting players that are competent replacements are going to be, there's going to be a lot of resistance to it. The cost is going to be there. Like the Damian Lewis, like Damian Lewis was my answer at guard. And he got 33% more on the open market than what I forecasted. And I thought I was being generous with a $10 million a year offer. So again, it's it's getting the broad brush stuff right. So for Miami, the mock draft as we finish, it was Darius Robinson, defensive lineman, Missouri, after a trade down. They stayed put, but they traded, they drafted a guy who can play on the edge. And if you would have told me, hey, you're, you guys are going to get Calais Campbell, I probably wouldn't have drafted Darius Robinson. I don't know that I would have picked an edge in, in general, but if you told me you were going to get Calais Campbell, uh, Darius Robinson, I, I think that's the best case, like dream scenario for him is to be that kind of player but like cut from the same cloth. So if you're in a competitive window, going to get somebody like that uh, going a different direction, as far as the skill set makes sense. Uh, Christian Haynes at 55. Darius Robinson did get drafted in the first round of 27 Arizona. Uh, Christian Haynes at 55. He really went 81 to Seattle. We mentioned that yesterday. Um, pick 90 came from the trade down in the first round. That was Malachi Corley the wide receiver from Western Kentucky. In reality, he went 65 to the Jets. So he would have been off the board in real life. The other two guys would have been there for you to make the picks if you wanted to um, in reality. But Corley, 25 spots early. The Jets were trying to get him in the early second round. Uh, they really liked him. Uh, McKinley Jackson, we already acknowledged, uh, actually went to 97. That was the trade, the future third round pick to get up into that spot. Um was six six picks away from where he actually got drafted. So again, the the top 100 guys, 27th mocked went 27, 55 mocked went 81st, 90th mocked went 65, 91st mocked went 97. Three of those four guys you could have had in those spots if you were in those spots. They didn't get in all those spots specifically, but uh, and then Isaac Arendo, the running back from Louisville, at 157. In reality, he went 129. And then the last three guys, Jerrion Jones, Tory Taylor, and Tip Ryman. Uh, we're all third or fourth round picks. 
So that's what you, you kind of lose it with the simulators when you just plug it in and you're like, okay, we're going to go with guys on the board here. And those guys were a little bit hotter commodities. Uh, Jerry Jones, 96, Torrey Taylor went 122 and tip Ryman went 82 versus the sixth and seventh round where we had them. So uh, the parallels are there. They draft a running back. They draft, they trade for a running back. They draft an offensive lineman. They draft a defensive lineman. They get a wide receiver. Like the, the, the right kinds of buttons were pushed. I'll take that. That is the offseason blueprint recap. Uh, in total, on offense and defense, uh, I would say you're better at running back, wide receiver, tight end. Um, I guess I should go here. Defensive line, linebacker, and secondary in totality than what you were in the blueprint. I, like a fool, invested too much of our free agent dollars on the offensive line. <laughs> so, um, but a lot of, a lot of fun parallels, a, a fun thing to look back on and kind of see how the Dolphins did it versus what we thought, hey, here's what you could do. And um, we'll, we'll do some more reflective looking at next week what the Dolphins have done and what the implications are of it. And that's what you have to look forward to next week uh, for us here on Locked on Dolphins. It is your team every day. I appreciate you guys checking the show. Fins up. Make it a great rest of your day. Enjoy your weekend. I'll be back to talk to you all again soon.